Well, welcome back to the third hour of the first show of Bedtime with Bruce. I'm Bruce, and it is now time for the much-heralded third hour, which is a journey into homoeroticism. I don't know that I've ever read anything that's considered homoeroticism. Nothing specific, I guess. I mean, so this is new for me. Uh, I have chosen for our first book a story called The House of the Vampire. Uh, the author is George Sylvester Virek. This book was published in 1907. And I've always found most of the modern day vampire books to have a lot of homoeroticism in them. But this particular book was considered the one of the first of its genre. So this is sort of the the, the, the forefather of all gay vampire books. <laughs> um, let's see, I have some notes here. Oh, apparently there's a lot of, uh, like, uh, it deals with a lot of psychic vampirism and not just the hemoglobin blood-sucking vampires, so like psi vampires. But we'll see. We'll see. Um, I'm just going to jump right into it. And I am going to read this book on my Nook. I'm sure you're all familiar with these. It's a digital reader. Uh, I've never read an entire book on a Nook, but uh, I got this one on there. So we're going we're to try it. I'll tell you what I think about it. Um, all right. Well, let's jump in. Okay, sorry. Okay, chapter one. All right, I'm sorry. New technology to me. Okay. The freakish little leader of the orchestra, newly imported from Sicily to New York, tossed his conductor's wand excitedly through the air, drowning with musical thunders, the hum of conversation, and the clatter of plates. Yet neither his apish demeanor nor the deafening noises that responded to his every movement of his agile body detracted attention from the figure of Reginald Clark and the young man at his side as they smilingly wound their way to the exit. The boy's expression was pleasant, with an inkling of wistfulness, while the soft glimmer of his lucid eyes betrayed the poet and the dreamer. The smile of Reginald Clark was the smile of a conqueror. A suspicion of silver in his crown of dark hair only added dignity to his bearing, while the infinitely ramified lines above the heavy-set mouth spoke at once of subtlety and of strength. Without stretch of the imagination, one might have likened him to a Roman cardinal of the days of the Borgias, who had miraculously stepped forth from the time-stained canvas and slipped into 20th century evening clothes. With the affability of complete self-possession, he nodded in response to the greetings from all sides, inclining his head with special politeness to a young woman whose sea-blue eyes were riveted upon his features with a look of mingled hate and admiration. The woman, disregarding his silent salutation, continued to stare at him, wild-eyed, as a damned stole in purgatory might look at Satan passing in regal splendor through the seventy times sevenfold circles of hell. Reginald Clark walked on unconcernedly through the rows of gay diners, interesting, gay diners, still smiling, affable, calm, but his companion bethought himself of certain rumors he had heard concerning Ethel Brandenburg's mad love for the man from whose features she could not even now turn her eyes. Evidently, her passion was unreciprocated. It had not always been so. There was a time in her career some years ago in Paris when it was whispered that she had secretly married him, not much later obtained a divorce. The matter was never cleared up, as both preserved an uncompromising silence upon the subject of their matrimonial experience. Certain it was that for a space, the genius of Reginald Clark had completely dominated her brush, and that, ever since he had thrown her aside, her pictures were but plagiarisms of her former artistic self. 
The cause of the rupture between them was only a matter of surmise, but the effect it had on the woman testified clearly to the remarkable power of Reginald Clark. He had entered her life, and behold, the world was transfixed on her canvases in myriad hues of transcending radiance. He had passed from it, and with him vanished the brilliancy of her coloring. As at sunset, the borrowed amber and gold fade from the face of the clouds. The glamour of Clark's name may have partly explained the secret of his charm, but even in circles where literary fame is no passport, he could, if he chose, exercise an almost ter terrible fascination. Subtle and profound, he had ransacked the coffers of medieval dialecticians and plundered the arsenals of the sophist. Many years later, when the vultures of misfortune had swooped down upon him and his name was no longer mentioned without a sneer, he was still remembered in New York drawing rooms as the man who had brought perfection, the art of talking. Even to dine with him was a liberal education. Clark's marvelous con conversational power was equaled only by his marvelous style. Ernest Fielding's heart le leaped in him at the thought that henceforth he would be privileged to live under one roof with the only writer of his generation who could lend to the English language the rich strength and rugged music of the Elizabethans. Reginald Clark was a master of many instruments. Milton's mighty organ was no less obedient to his touch than the little lute of the troubadour. He was never the same. That was his strength. Clark's style possessed at once the chiseled chast chasteness of a Greek marbled column and the elaborate deviltry of the late Renaissance. At times his winged words seemed to flutter down the page frantically like a Baroque angel. At other times nothing could have more adequately described his manner than the timeless calm of the gaunt pyramids. The two men had reached the street. Reginald wrapped his long spring coat round him. I shall expect you tomorrow at four, he said. The tone of his voice was deep and melodious, suggesting hidden depths and cadences. I shall be punctual. The younger man's voice trembled as he spoke. I look forward to your coming with much pleasure. I am interested in you. The glad blood mounted to Ernest's cheeks as, at praise from the austere lips of this arbiter of literary elegance. An almost imperceptible smile crept over the other man's features. I am proud that my work interests you, was all the boy could say. I think it is quite amazing, but at present... Here, Clark drew out a watch set with jewels. I am afraid I must bid you goodbye. He held Ernest's hand for a moment in a firm, genial grasp then turned away briskly while the boy remained standing open-mouthed. The crowd jostling against him carried him almost off his feet, but his eyes followed far into the night the masterful figure of Reginald Clark, toward whom he felt himself drawn with every fiber of his body and the warm enthusiasm of his generous youth. Chapter 2 With elastic step, Inhaling the night air with voluptuous delight, Reginald Clark made his way down Broadway. Lying stretched out before him, bathed in light and pulsating with life. His world-embracing intellect was powerfully attracted by the giant city's motley activities. On the street, as in the salon, his magnetic power compelled recognition, and he stepped through the midst of the crowd as a Circassian blade cleaves water. After walking a block or two, he suddenly halted before a, jewel, a jeweler's stop shop. Arrayed in the window were priceless gems that shone in a glare of electricity like mystical serpent eyes, green, pomegranate, and water blue. And as he stood there, the dazzling radiance before him was transformed in the prism of his mind into something great and very wonderful that might someday be a poem. Then his attention was diverted by a small group of tiny girls dancing on the sidewalk to the husky strains of an old hurdy-gurdy. He joined the circle of amused spectators to watch those pink ribbon bits of femininity swaying airily to and fro in unison with the tune. One especially attracted his notice, a slim, olive-colored girl from a land where it is always spring. Her whole being translated into music with hair disheveled and feet hardly touching the ground. The girl suggested an orange leaf dancing on a sunbeam. The rasping street organ, perchance, brought 
brought to her melodious reminiscences of some flute playing Savoy Savoyard boy, brown limbed and dark of hair. For several minutes, Reginald Clark followed with keen delight each delicate curve her graceful limbs described. Then, was it that she grew tired, or the stranger's persistent scrutiny embarrassed her? The music oozed out of her movements. They grew slower, angular, almost clumsy. The look of interest in Clark's eyes died, but his whole form quivered, as if the rhythm of the music and the dance had mysteriously entered into his blood. He continued his stroll, seemingly without aim. In reality, he followed with nervous intensity the multiform undulations of the populace, swarming through Broadway in either direction. Like the giant whose strength was rekindled every time he touched his mother the earth, Reginald Clark seemed to draw fresh vitality from every contact with life. He turned east along 14th Street, where cheap vaudevilles are strung together as glass pearls on the throat of a wanton, gaudy billboard. I'm sorry. He turned east along 14th Street, where cheap vaudevilles are strung together as glass pearls on the throat of a wanton. Gaudy billboards, drenched in clamorous red, proclaim the tawdry attractions within. Much to the surprise of the doorkeeper at a particularly evil-looking music hall, Reginald Clark lingered in the lobby and finally even bought a ticket that entitled him to enter this sordid wilderness of decollete art. Street snipes, a few working men, dilapidated sportsmen, and women whose ruined youth, thick layers of powder and paint, even in this artificial light, could not restore, constituted the bulk of the audience. Reginald Clark, apparently unconscious of the curiosity, surprise, and envy that his appearance excited, seated himself at a table near the stage, ordering from the solicitous waiter only a cocktail and a program. The drink he left untouched, while his eyes greedily ran down the lines of the announcement. When he had found what he sought, he lit a cigar, paying no attention to the boards, but studying the audience with cursory interest, until the appearance of Betsy the Hyacinth Girl. When she began to sing, his mind still wandered. The words of her song were crude, but not without a certain lilt that delighted the uncultured ear, while the girl's voice was thin to the point of being unpleasant. When, however, she came to the burden of the song, Clark's manner changed suddenly. Laying down his cigar, he listened with rapt attention, eagerly gazing at her. For, as she sang the last line and tore the hyacinth blossoms from her hair, there crept into her voice a strangely poignant, pathetic little thrill that redeemed the ex execrable faultiness of her singing and brought the rude audience under her spell. Clark, too, was captivated by that tremor, the infinite sadness of which suggested the plaint of souls moaning low at night when lust preys on creatures marked for its spoil. The singer paused. Still those luminous eyes were upon her. She grew nervous. It was only with tremendous difficulty that she reached the refrain. As she sang the opening lines of the last stanza, an inscrutable smile curled on Clark's, Clark's lips. She noticed the man's relentless gaze and faltered. When the burden came, her singing was hard and cracked. The tremor had gone from her voice. Whew! It's not very homoerotic just yet, but I think it's getting there. Chapter 3. Long before the appointed time... Ernest walked up and down in front of the abode of Reginald Clark, a stately apartment house overlooking the Riverside Drive. Misshapen automobiles were chasing by, carrying to the, to the cool river's marge the restlessness and the fever of American life. But the bustle and the noise seemed to the boy only auspicious omens of the future. Jack, his roommate and dearest friend, had left him a month ago, and for a space, he had felt very lonely. His young and delicate soul found it difficult to grapple, grapple with the vague fears that his nervous brain engendered. When whispered sounds seemed to float from hidden, when wrestle, whispered sounds seemed to float from hidden corners, and the stairs creaked under mysterious feet, he needed the voice of loving kindness to call him back from the valley of haunting shadows, where his poet's soul was wont to linger over long. 
In his hours of weakness, the light caress of a comrade renewed his strength and rekindled in his hand the flaming sword of song. And at nightfall, he would bring the day's harvest to Clark as a worshiper, scattering precious stones, incense, and tapestries at the feet of a god. Surely he would be very happy. And as the heart at times leads the feet to the goal of its desire, while multicolored dreams like dancing girls lull the will to sleep, he suddenly found himself stepping from the elevator car to Reginald Clark's apartment. Already was he raising his hand to strike the electric bell when a sound from within made him pause halfway. No, there's no help, he heard Clark say. His voice had a hard metallic clangor. A boyish voice answered plaintively. What the words were, Ernest could not distinctly hear, but the suppressed sob in them almost brought the tears to his eyes. He instinctively knew that this was the finale of some tragedy. He withdrew hastily so as to not be a witness of an interview that was not meant for his ears. Reginald Clark probably had a good reason for parting with his young friend, whom Ernest surmised to be Abel Fenton, a talented boy whom the master had taken under his wings. In the apartment, a momentary silence had ensued. This was interrupted by Clark. It will come again in a month, in a year, in two years. No, no, it is all gone, sobbed the boy. Nonsense, you are merely nervous. But that is just why we must part. There is no room in one house for two nervous people. I was not such a nervous wreck before I met you. Am I to blame for it? For your morbid fancies, your extravagance, the slow tread of a nervous disease, perhaps? Who can tell? But I am all confused. I don't know what I am saying. Everything is so puzzling. Life, friendship, you. I fancied you cared for my career, and now you end our friendship without a thought? We must all follow the law of our being. The laws are within us and in our control. They are within us and beyond us. It is the physiological structure of our brains, our nerve cells, that makes and mars our lives. Our mental companionship was so beautiful. It was meant to last. That is the dream of youth. Nothing lasts. Everything flows. Pantare. We are all but sojourners in an end. Friendship, as love, is an illusion. Life has nothing to take from a man who has no illusions. It has nothing to give him. They said goodbye. At the door, Ernest met Abel. Where are you going, he asked. For a little pleasure trip. Ernest knew that the boy lied. He remembered that Abel Fenton was at work upon some book, a play, or a novel. It occurred to him to inquire how far he had progressed with it. Abel smiled sadly. I'm not writing it. Not writing it. Reginald is. I'm afraid I don't understand. Never mind. Someday you will. I am so happy you came, Reginald Clark said as he conducted Ernest into his studio. It was a large, luxuriously furnished room overlooking the Hudson and Riverside Drive. Dazzled and bewildered, the boy's eyes wandered from object to object, from picture to statue. Despite seemingly incongruous details, the whole arrangement possessed style and distinction. A satire, a say, a satyr, satyr, a satyr on the mantelpiece whispered obscene secrets into the ears of Saint Cecilia. The argent limbs of Ant 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 Antinous, the argent limbs of Antinous brushed against the garments of Mona Lisa, and from a corner, a little Rococo lady peered coquettishly at the great image of an Egyptian sphinx. There was a picture of Napoleon facing the image of the cr crucified. Above all, in the semi-darkness artificially produced by heavily, heavy draped draperies towered two busts. Shakespeare and Balzac, Ernest exclaimed with some surprise. Yes, exclaimed Reginald, they are my gods. His gods? Surely there was a key to Clark's character. Our gods are ourselves raised to the highest power, power. Clark and Shakespeare.
Even to Ernest's admiring mind, it seemed almost blasphemous to name a contemporary, however esteemed in one breath, with the mighty master of song, whose great gaunt shadow, thrown out against the backgrounds of years, had assumed immense, unproportionate, monstrous dimensions. Yet something might be said for the comparison. Clark undoubtedly was universally broad, and undoubtedly concealed, with no less exquisite taste than the Elizabethan, his own personality, under the splendid raiment of his art. They certainly were affinities. It would not have been surprising to see... <laughs> it would not have been surprising to him to see the clear, calm head of Shakespeare rise from behind his host. Perhaps, who knows, the very presence of the bust in his room had, to some extent, subtly and secretly molded Reginald Clark's life. A man's soul, like the chameleon, takes color from its environment. Even comparative trifles, the number of the house in which we live, or the color of the wallpaper of a room, may determine a destiny. The boy's eyes were again surveying the fantastic surroundings in which he found himself. While, from a corner, Clark's eyes were watching his every movement, as if to follow his thoughts into the innermost labyrinth of the mind. It seemed to Ernest, under the spell of this passing fancy, as though each vase, each vase, each picture, each curio in the room was reflected in Clark's work. In a long-queued porcelain Chinese Mandarin, he distinctly recognized a quaint quatrain in one of Clark's most marvelous poems. And he could have sworn that the grin of the Hindu monkey god on the writing table reappeared in the weird rhythm of two stanzas, whose grotesque cadence had haunted him for years. At last, Clark broke the silence. Do you like my studio, he asked. The simple question brought Ernest back to reality. Like it? Why, it's stunning. It set, it set up in me the queerest train of thought. I, too, have been in a whimsical mood tonight. Fancy, unlike genius, is an infectious disease. What is the peculiar form, it assumed, in your case? I have been wondering whether all the things that environ us today, day by day, are, in a measure, fashioning our thought life. I sometimes think that even my little Mandarin and this monkey idol, which, by the way, I brought from India, are exerting a mysterious but nonetheless real influence on my work. Great God, Ernest responded. I've had the identical thought. How very strange, Clark exclaimed, with seeming surprise. It is said tritely but truly that great minds travel the same roads, Ernest observed, inwardly pleased. No, the older man subtly remarked, but they reach the same conclusion by a different route. And you attach serious importance to our fancy? Why not? Clark was gazing abstractedly at the bust of Balzac. A man's geniuses commiserate with his ability of absorbing from life the element, the elements essential to his artistic completion. Balzac possessed this power in a remarkable degree, but strange to say, it was evil that attracted him most. He absorbed it as a sponge absorbs water, perhaps because there was so little of it in his own makeup. He must have purified the atmosphere around him for miles by bringing all the evil that was floating in the air or slumbering in men's souls to the point of his pen. And he, his eyes were resting on Shakespeare's features as a man might look upon the face of a brother, he too was such a nature. In fact, he was the most perfect type of the artist. Nothing escaped his mind. From life and from books, he drew his material each time, reshaping it with a master hand. Creation is a divine prerogative. Recreation, infinitely more wonderful than mere calling into existence, is the per prerogative of the poet. Shakespeare took his colors from many palettes. That is why he is so great, and that is why his work is incredibly greater than he. It alone explains his unique achievement. Who was he? What education did he have? What opportunities? None. And yet... We find in his work the wisdom of Bacon, Sir Walty Raleigh's fancies and discoveries, Marlowe's verbal thunders, and the mysterious loveliness of Mr. W.H. 
Ernest listened, entranced by the sound of Clark's mellifluous voice. He was indeed a master of the spoken word, and possessed a miraculous power of giving to the wildest fancies an air of resemblance. All right, chapter five. Hold on. Woo! Yes, said Walcom. The sculptor is a most curious thing. What is, asked Ernest, who had been over dreaming about the sphinx that was looking at him from its corner with the sarcastic smile of 5,000 years. How our dreams of yesterday stare at us like strangers today. On the contrary, remarked Reginald, it would be strange if they were still to know us. In fact, it would be unnatural. The skies above us and the earth underfoot are in perpetual motion. Each atom of our physical nature is vibrating with unimaginable rapidity. Change is identical with life. It sometimes seems, said the sculptor, as if thoughts evaporated like water. Why not? Under favorable conditions. But where do they go? Surely they cannot perish utterly. Yes, that is the question, or rather it is not a question. Nothing is ever lost in the spiritual universe. But what, inquired Ernest, is the particular reason for your reflection? It is this, the sculptor replied. I had a striking motive, and I lost it. Do you remember, he continued, speaking to Reginald, the Narcissus I was working on the last time when you called at my studio? Yes, it was a striking thing and impressed me very much, though I cannot recall it at the moment. Well, it was a commission. An eccentric young millionaire had offered me $8,000 for it. I had an absolute original conception, <clears throat> but I cannot e execute it. It's as if a breeze had carried it away. That is very regrettable. Well, I should say so, replied the sculptor. Ernest smiled, for everybody knew of Wacom's domestic troubles. Having twice figured in the divorce court, saying he was at present defraying the expenses of three households. The sculptor had meanwhile seated himself at Reginald's writing table, unintentionally scanning a typewritten page that was lying before him. Like all artists, something of a madman and something of a child, he at first glanced over its contents distractedly. Excuse me. Then with an interest so intense that he was no longer aware of the impropriety of his action. By Jove, he cried, what is this? It's an epic of the French Revolution, Reginald replied, not without surprise. But man, do you but man, do you know that I have discovered my motive in it? What do you mean? asked Ernest, looking first at Reginald and then at Walkingham, whose sanity he began to doubt. Listen. And the sculptor read, trembling with emotion, a long passage whose measured cadence delighted Ernest's ear without, however, enlightening his mind as to the purport of Wacom's cryptic remark. Reginald said nothing, but the gleam in his eye showed that this time, at least, his interest was alert. Wacom saw the hopelessness of making clear his meaning without an explanation. I forgot you haven't a sculptor's mind. I am so constituted that, with me, all impressions are immediately translated into the sense of form. I do not hear music, I see it rise with domes and spires, with painted windows, and with arabesques. The scent of the roast is to me tangible, I can almost feel it with my hands, so your prose suggested to me now by its rhythmic flow, something which at first indefinite crystallized finally into my lost conception of Narcissus. It is extraordinary, murmured Reginald, I have not dreamed of it. So, you do not think it rather fantastic? remarked Ernest, circumscribing his true meaning. No, it is quite possible. Perhaps his Narcissus was engaging the subconscious strata of my mind while I was writing this passage, and surely it would be strange if the undercurrents of our mind were not reflected in our style. Do you mean, then, that a subtle psychologist ought to be able to read beneath and between our lines not only what we express, but also what we leave unexpressed? Undoubtedly. Even if, while we are writing, we are unconscious of our state of mind, that would open a new field to psychology. Only to those that have the key, that can read the hidden symbols, 
It is to me a matter, of course, that every mind movement below or above the threshold of consciousness must, of necessity, leave its imprint, faintly or clearly, as the case may be, upon our activities. This book may explain why books that seem intolerably dull to the majority delight the hearts of the few, Ernest interjected. Yes, to the few that possess the key. I distinctly remember how an uncle of mine once laid down a discussion on higher mathematics and blushed fearfully when his innocent wife looked over his shoulder. The man who written it was a Roo. Then the seemingly most harmless books may secretly possess the power of scattering in young minds the seed of corruption, Walkham remarked. If they happen to understand, Clark observed thoughtfully, I can very well conceive of a lecherous textbook of the calculus or of a reporter's story of a picnic in which burnt under the surface undiscoverable save to the initiate the tragic passion of Tristram and Islet. I'm kind of hoping we get into a little more uh, action here. Huh, water. Hmm. All right, chapter six. Several weeks had elapsed since the conversation in Reginald Clark's studio. The spring was now well advanced and had sprinkled the meadows with flowers and the bookshelves of the reviewers with fiction. The latter Ernest turned to good account, but from the flowers no poem blossomed forth. In writing about other men's books, he almost forgot that the springtide had brought to him no bouquet of song. Only now and then, like a rippling of water, disquietude troubled his soul. The strange personality of the master of the house had enveloped the lad's thoughts with an impenetrable maze. The day before, Jack had come on a, a flying visit from Harvard, but even he was unable to free from Ernest's soul from the obsession of Reginald Clark. Ernest was lazily stretching himself on a couch, waving the smoke of his cig cigarette to Reginald, who was writing at his desk. Your friend Jack is delightful, Reginald remarked, looking up from his papers and his ebon-colored hair contrasts prettily with the gold in yours. I should imagine that you are temperamental antipodes. Antipodes. So we are, but friendship bridges the chasm between. How long have you known him? We have been chums ever since our sophomore year. What attracted you in him? It is no simple matter to define exactly one's likes and dislikes. Even a tiny protoplasmic animal appears to be highly complex under the microscope. How can we hope to analyze with any degree of certitude our souls, especially when under the influence of feeling we see as through a glass darkly? It is true that personal feeling colors our spectacles and distorts the perspective. Still, we should not shrink from self-analysis. We must learn to see clearly into our own hearts. If we would give vitality to our work, Indiscretion is the better part of literature, and it behooves us to hound down each delicate, elusive shadow of emotion and convert it into copy. It is because I am so self-analytical that I realize that the complexity of my nature and am at a loss to define my emotions. Conflicting forces sway us hither and thither without neutralizing each other. Physicology isn't physics. There were many things to attract me to Jack. He was subtler, more sympathetic, more feminine, perhaps, than the rest of my college mates. That, I have noticed, in fact, his lashes are those of a girl. You still care for him much? It isn't a matter of caring. We are two beings that live one life. A sort of psychic Siamese twins? Almost. Why, the matter is very simple. Our hearts root in the same soil. The same books have nourished us, the same great winds have shaken our being, and the same sunshine called forth the beautiful blossom of friendship. He struck me, if you will pardon my saying so, as a rather commonplace companion. There is in him a hidden sweetness and a depth of feeling which only intimate contact reveals. He is now taking his postgraduate course at Harvard, 
and for well nigh two months we have not met. Yet so many invisible threads of common experience unite us that we could meet after years and still be near each other. You are very young, Reginald replied. What do you mean? Ah, uh, never mind. So you do not believe that two hearts may ever beat as one? No, that is an auditory delusion. Not even two clocks beat in unison. There is always a discrepancy, infinitesimal perhaps, but a discrepancy nevertheless. A sharp ring of the bell interrupted the conversation. A moment later, a curly head peeped through the door. Hello, Ernest. How are you, old man? The intruder cried with a laugh in his voice. Then, noticing Clark, he shook hands with the great man, unceremoniously with the nonchalance of the healthy young animal bred in the atmosphere of an American college. His touch seemed to thrill Clark, who <clears throat> breathed heavily and then stepped to the window as if to conceal the flush of vitality in his cheek. It was a breath of springtide that Jack had brought with him. Youth is a prince charming. To shriveled veins, the pressure of his hand imparts a spark of, of animation, and middle age unfolds its petals in his presence as a sunflower gazing at late noon once more upon its lord. I have come to take Ernest away from you, said Jack. He looks a trifle paler than usual, and a day's outing will stir the red corpuscles in his blood. I have no doubt that you will take very good care of him, Reginald replied. Where shall we go, Ernest asked absentmindedly. But he did not hear the answer, for Reginald's skepticisms had more deeply impressed him than he cared to confess to himself. Chapter 7 The two boys had bathed their souls in the sea breeze and their eyes in light. The tide of pleasure-loving humanity jostling against them had carried their feet to the Lion Palace. From there, seated at the table and quenching their thirst with highballs, they watched the feverish palpitations of the city's lifeblood pulsating in the veins of Coney Island, to which they had drifted from Brighton Beach. Ernest blew thoughtful rings of smoke into the air. Do you notice the ferocious look and the mien of the average frequenter of this island resort, he said to Jack, whose eyes following the impulse of his more robust youth, were examining specimens of feminine flotsam on the waves of the crowd. It is, he continued, speaking to himself for want of an audience, the American who is in for having a good time, and he is going to get it. Like a huntsman, he follows the scent of happiness, but I warrant that always it eludes him. Perhaps his mad race is only the epitome of humanity's vain pursuit of pleasure, the eternal cry that is never answered. But Jack was not listening. There are times in the life of every man when a petticoat is more attractive to him than all the philosophy of the world. Ernest was a little hurt, and it was not without some silent remonstrance that he acquiesced when Jack invited to their table two creatures that once were women. Why? But they are... Interesting. I cannot find so. They both had seen better times, of course. Then money losses came with work in shop or factory and the voice of the tempter in the commercial wilderness. One, a frail, nervous little creature who had instinctively chosen a seat at Ernest's side, kept prattling in his ear, ready to tell the story of her life to anyone who was willing to treat her to a drink. Something in her demeanor interested him. And then I had a stroke of luck. The manager of a vaudeville was my friend and decided to give me a trial. He thought I had a voice. They called me Betsy, the hyacinth girl. At first it seemed as if people liked to hear me, but then I suppose it was because I was new. After a month or two they discharged me. And why? I suppose I was just used up, that's all. Frightful. I never had much of a voice in the tobacco smoke and the wine. I love wine. She gulped down her glass. And do you like your present occupation? Why not? Am I not young? Am I not pretty? This she said not with parrot-wise, but with a simple coquettishness that was all her own. On the way to the steamer a few moments later, Ernest asked half reproachfully, Jack, and you really enjoyed our conversation, didn't you? Do you mean this? Why, yes, she was very agreeable. Ernest frowned. 
We're 20, Ernest. And then you see it's like a course in sociology. Susie. Susie, was that her name? Yes. So she had a name? Of course. She shouldn't. It should be a number. They may not be pillars of society. Still, they're human. Yes, said Ernest. That's the most horrible part about it. All right, chapter 8. The moon was shining brightly. Swift and sure, the prow of the night boat parted the silvery foam. The smell of young flesh, peals of laughter, a breathless pi pianola, the tripping of dancing feet, voices hushed, voices husked with drink, and voices soft with love, the shrill accents of vulgarity, hustling waiters, shop girls, bourgeois couples, bourgeois couples, tired families of four and upward, sleeping children, a boy selling candy, the crying of babies. The two friends were sitting on the upper deck, muffled in their long raincoats. In the distance, the Empire City rose, radiant from the mist. Say, Ernest, you should spout some poetry as of old. Are your lips stricken mute, or are you still thinking of Coney Island? Oh no, the swift wind has taken it away. I am clean, I am pure. Life has passed me. It has kissed me, but it has left no trace. He looked upon the face of his friend. Their hands met. They felt with keen enjoyment the beauty of the night and their friendship and of the city below. Then Ernest's lips moved softly, musically, twitching with a strange ascetic passion that trembled in his voice as he began. Huge, steel-ribbed monsters rise into the air. Her Babylonian towers, while on high, like gilt-scaled serpents, glide the swift trains by, or, underfoot, creep into their secret lair, a thousand lights or jewels in her hair. The sea her girdle and her crown the sky, her lifeblood throbs, the fevered pulses fly. Immense, defiant, breathless, she stands there, and ever listens in the ceaseless den, waiting for him, her lover, who shall come, whose singing lips shall boldly claim their own, and render so and render sonnet what was in her dumb. The splendor and the madness and the sin, her dreams in iron and her thoughts of stone. He paused. The boat glided on. For a long time, neither spoke a word. After a while, Jack broke the silence. And are you dreaming of becoming the lyric mouth of the city, of giving utterance to all of its yearnings, its dreams in iron, and its thoughts in stone? No, replied Ernest simply. Not yet. It is strange to what impressions the, the brain will respond. In Clark's house, in the midst of inspiring things, inspiration failed me. But while I was with that girl, an idea came to me. An idea, big, real. Will it deal with her? Ernest smiled. Oh no, she personally has nothing to do with it. At least not directly. It was the commotion of blood and brain, the air, the change. I don't know what. What will it be, asked Jack with interest, all alert. A play, a wonderful play, and its heroine will be a princess, a little princess with a yellow veil. What of the plot? That I shall not tell you today. In fact, I shall not breathe a word to anyone. It will take you all by surprise, and the public by storm. So it will be playable? If I am not very much mistaken, you will see it on Broadway within a year. And, he added graciously, I will let you have two box seats for the first night. They both chuckled at the thought, and their hearts leaped within them. I hope you will finish it soon, Jack observed. After a while, you haven't done much of late. A similar reflection was on my mind when you came yesterday. That accounts for the low spirits in which you found me. Ah, indeed, Jack replied, measuring Ernest with a look of wonder. But now your face is aglow. It seems like the blood rushes to your head swifter at the call of an idea than at the kiss of a girl. Thank God, Ernest remarked with a sigh of relief. Mighty forces within me are fashioning the limpid thought. Passion may grind us by the I'm sorry, passion may grip us by the throat momentarily. Upon our backs, we may feel the lashes of desire and bathe our souls in flames of many hues. 
but the joy of activity is the ultimate passion. All right. We're at chapter 9 now. It seemed, indeed, as if work was to earnest what the sting of pleasure is to the average human animal. The interplay of his mental forces gave him the sensuous satisfaction of a woman's embrace. His eyes sparkled, his muscle tightened, the joy of creation was upon him. Often very material reasons like stone weights tied to the wings of a bird stayed the flight of his imagination. Magazines were waiting for his copy, and he was not in the position to let them wait. They supplied his bread and butter. Between the bread and butter, however, the play was growing, scene by scene. In the lone hours of the night, he spun upon the loom of his fancy a brilliant weft of swift desire, heavy, perfumed, oriental, interwoven, with bits of gruesome tenderness. The thread of his own life intertwined with the thread of the story. All genuine art is autobiography. It is not, however, necessarily a revelation of the artist's actual self, but of a myriad of potential selves. Ah, our own potential selves. They are sometimes beautiful, often horrible, and always fascinating. They loom to heavens, none too high for our reach. They stray to yawning hells beneath our very feet. The man who encompasses heaven and hell is a perfect man, but there are many heavens and more hells. The artist snatches fire from both. Surely the assassin feels no more intensely the lust of murder than the poet who depicts it in glowing words. The things he writes are as real to him as the things that he lives, but in his realm the poet is supreme. His hands may be red with blood or white with leprosy. He still remains king. Woe to him, however, if he transcends the limits of his kingdom and translates into action the secret of his dreams. The throng that before applauded him will stone his quivering body or nail to the cross his delicate hands and feet. Sometimes days passed before Ernest could concentrate his mind upon his play. Then the fever seized him again and he strung pearl on pearl, line on line, without entrusting a word to paper. Even to discuss his work before it had received the final brush strokes would have seemed indecent to him. Reginald, too, seemed to be in a turmoil of work. Ernest had little chance to speak to him, and to drop even a hint of his plans between the courses at breakfast would have been desecration. Sunset followed sunset, night followed night. The stripling April had made room for the Lady May. The play was almost completed in Ernest's mind, and he thought with little shudder of the sight physical travail of the actual writing. He felt that the transcript from brain to paper would demand all his powers, for, of late, his thoughts seemed strangely evanescent. They seemed to him to run from him whenever he attempted to seize them. The day was glad with sunshine, and he decided to take a long walk in the solitude of the Palisades to steady hand and nerve for the final task. He told Reginald of his intention, but met with little response. Reginald's face was wan and bore the particular pallor of one who had worked late at night. You must be frightfully busy, Ernest asked with genuine concern. So I am, Reginald replied. I always work in a white heat. I am restless, nervous, feverish, and can find no place, no peace until I have given utterance to all that clamors after birth. What is it that is so engaging on your mind, the epic of the French Revolution? Oh no. I should have never undertaken that. I shouldn't have done a stroke of work on it for several weeks. In fact, ever since Wacom called, I simply couldn't. It seemed as if a rough hand had in some way destroyed the web of my thought. Poetry in the writing is like red-hot glass before the master blower has fashioned it into birds, trees, and strange, fantastic shapes. A draught caused by the opening of a door may distort it. But at present I am engaged upon more important work. I am modeling a vessel, not of fine spun glass, but of molten gold. You make me exceedingly anxious to know what you have in store for us. It seems to me you have reached a point where even you can no longer surpass yourself. Reginald smiled. 
Your praise is too generous, yet it warms like sunshine. I will confess that my conception is unique. It combines with the ripeness of my technique the freshness of the second spring. Ernest was bubbling with anticipated delights. His soul responded to Reginald's touch as a heart to the winds. When, he cried, shall we be privileged to see it? Reginald's eyes were already straying back to his writing table. If the gods are propitious, he said, I shall complete it tonight. Tomorrow is my recaption, and I have half promised to read it then. Perhaps I shall be in the position soon to let you see my play. Let us hope so, Reginald replied absentmindedly. The egotism of the artist has once more chained him to his work. Okay, that was the end of chapter 9. I think this is a good stopping point. I am tired. It is bedtime. I would like to sincerely thank you all for joining me. You can see us all the time. We're going to archive everything. We're going to have this show every night at Bedtime for Bruce. I'm sorry, not Bedtime for Bruce. It is Bedtime for Bruce. The website is BedtimeWithBruce.com. And it is Bedtime for Bruce now. Um, it has been a pleasure. And... This is a work in progress, so you will be seeing changes as we try to perfect this and get better at it. But I had a great time tonight, and I hope you did as well. And I would like to see you next time. So thank you, thank you, and go to bed. It's bedtime. <laughs>